Hi, my name is Greg. I'm from the band Terriginous, and I'm going to teach you how to play Air Apparent by Opeth. In the beginning, we're start, starting with a nice E flat 5 chord, not E flat 5, E flat 5. If you want to hit the next one on time, it's probably better to count. The last, the next hit is on the second measure, 4 E and Da, if you know 16th notes, 1 E and a 2 E and a 3 E and a 4 E and Da. If you got a good sense of timing, you can probably hit it, but if not, don't just stab at it randomly. You can listen to the drums, drums laying down a nice simple beat there. Just keep track of the 16ths in your head. One, two, and a three, and a four, and Da. Pick slide. Now throughout the intro you got these epic slides all the way up to 18th fret, a B flat up there. The easiest way to do that, always make sure you're looking at the fret you want to slide to. Usually your hand will magically stop there. Let me try that again. Um, the next riff we're going into, uh, there's actually two different guitar parts. Opeth, a lot of times when they have two different guitar parts, they actually double both parts. It's actually hard to suss out which one is which, but I'm pretty sure I got it. Um, uh, the one part, the more interesting part. There's that epic slide again. It's important you get everything to ring as much as possible. This kind of thing can always be a pain on guitar because you're playing the same notes in different places. The other guitar part is actually very, very simple. Just three, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. Next riff, you wait while the keyboard plays. Then you're back to your E flat five. That leads you into the next riff. A lot of times when there's a pick slide into a riff, that first note you'll hit after the pick slide, if you're playing it live, your pick might end up hitting, normally you should be over here obviously, guitar players, we all know this, right? But you'll end up hitting more over the fretboard for that one shot. All right, so that next riff. So this song is at a tempo of about 73 or 72. Pretty slow tempo, 72, 73 beats per minute. But there are a lot of 30 second notes. The way to keep track of your 30 second notes and sound really tight, you don't wanna just spaz out when you hit them because you wanna, what we call subdivide. A lot of times if I'm counting 30 second notes, I'll actually count the beat twice as fast. Easier to count 16th notes than it is to count 30 second. Well, those are triplets. See, point proven. Still triplets, that's okay, I can edit this. So, while the, the feel is, you might want to tap your foot, bop your head twice as fast. Until you get the hang of it. All right, so this riff consists of mostly octaves. Michael loves these octaves. If you don't know how to do this yet, octave is when you play the same note in like low G and middle G, for example, is what you're starting on. Like a power chord, just squish that inside string with the side of your first finger. 
There's a lot of sliding around, which tells me um, a lot of times. So you have the open E string. This song's tuned in standard. You have the open E string. A lot of thrash metal bands would love uh, Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth, love playing that low E and then the middle E on the next string, seventh fret. Whether it's an octave, power chord, part of the riff, whatever. Um, but in a lot of Opeth stuff, Michael really loves to hit that E on 12th fret. Has a little bit of a duller sound. Um, in this riff, it's appropriate because he's sliding so much back and forth. So this riff consists mainly of those octaves. You have your 32nd notes on the low E in between. An occasional artificial harmonic on that part. I might be doing the, the higher one. Depending on where your thumb, the way to get an artificial harmonic is to get the side of your thumb to hit the string right after the pick. A little bit of a pain to get the hang of, but once you do, you can get it. You can get a lot of different harmonics on the same note. That all depends on where your right hand is. The more distortion you use, the easier it is to get those to pop out. So. Um All right, so that gets you through that whole riff. Um, the uh, I'll play it slow for you. Of course, you also have that little chromatic in the middle of the riff. Um, about uh, the third time the riff happens, a harmony pops in. Uh, that's not in my transcription, but it's easy enough. It's just a minor third above, which is three frets. So instead of, if you got a buddy, instead of have he or she play, have him or her play. And combined, it sounds roughly like. Although if you play it on one guitar, the amount of distortion makes it a little too crunchy to sound nearly as cool. Higher guitar. And then that brings you to the next riff. The last time of the riff, you end up hitting this another little diminished fifth or flat five chord here. So the key here, Michael loves to do these kind of things where he's maybe playing a power chord, diminished fifth, or some kind of little chord with the low note moving. And then finally ends on this little minor third here. The timing of it I'm going to talk about in a second. But first we'll get through the rest of the riff. So you're going to slide way up to ninth fret, little pull off, another pull off. Slide down to four. Sorry, it's pull off, pick, pick, slide. One of the things I love about Opeth, especially the heavy stuff, is they find cool things about the guitar. It's great to get that half step ringing. It sounds nice and crunchy. Then to end off the riff, remember those octaves we were doing earlier where we're squishing the middle string? Here's a rare occasion where you don't want to squish the middle string. Get another real punchy octave half step and an octave of the lower note. And that riff repeats three times as is.
Now, I want your timing to be real nice and tight on that. So the last time of the riff, he does something that kind of helps you with the timing for the earlier part. The last time, instead of holding those chords out, he chunks away at them 16th notes. And remember, 16th notes are not fast. Our beats per minute's only about 72, 73. So chunking away at those 16th notes, you have a group of four, then threes after that. Now if you look back at the riff, at the, the previous riff, you have a quarter note. Yeah, quarter note gets one beat, but here you subdivide, you count the smaller pieces. It's four sixteenth notes long. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Just like the riff that's coming up. And then, um, so that'll help your timing with the part before. To get out of this riff, to get out of this riff, and again you have uh, harmony on those last three. So have your buddy play three frets higher on those last three. It's another, also octaves, but it's another uh, minor third. Got a sweet little drum fill, and then that gets you into the next riff. Next riff, the solo is going to go over this. Um, you start out with F power chord, but careful. Metal players were used to playing F power chord, E power chord. He doesn't do that. Does this little minor six interval. Um, interesting thing about this interval: this usually implies the major chord with the high note being the root. Although here, they're hammering home that low E on the bass as well. So it sort of sounds like E is still your root of that second chord. Got our slide up to seventh fret. Slide with ring finger or pinky. Um, because of what you're gonna be doing next. This next part of the riff is really a neat little thing. Do that again. It's using the whole tone scale there. The whole tone scale is just whole steps. Works out really cool on guitar because it'll be all even frets on one string. To do the same whole tone scale on the next string, it's all odd frets. Now when you're switching between these strings, you could do something really slick where you don't move your hand on this low part. Great practice, not really a practical way to play it though. You can get away with one little hand movement there. So in other words, you're doing both hammer-ons in that section, all the notes with pointer and ring. Again, want to make a nice exercise, use all four fingers. But in real life, we're not going to do it that way. Then you got some more octaves. Followed by a little chromatic deal. Um, the, uh, there's a harmony to this part. The harmony to this part's really cool. My transcription only has one of the parts, but it's easy to figure out because the right and left guitar swap parts. The first time, one guitar goes on E, D sharp, and F, or E, E flat, and F. And the other guitar is starting on G. G, G flat, A flat. Then they swap parts. What was the lower guitar goes to the higher part. Higher, the higher guitar goes to the lower part. So one guitar part. While the other is going. And so if you got a buddy, you can have fun with that. Then the solo kicks in over that same riff. Uh, this is Frederick's solo. 
So pretty wicked solo, not too hard, except for the one part near the end. So we start off half step bend. Pretty simple little lick. That rhythm is really a pain to describe. Um, we've also moved, sorry, I forgot, we moved to 12-8. You can still count 12-8 as 4-4, but it's all triplets. When it comes to transcribing something, if something is all triplets all the time, I find it much easier to put in 12-8 because uh, it's easier to write the different subdivisions and everything. So, um, but it's a little pain to read this rhythm on, on the guitar. He's also not being super strict with it, watching some, uh, some live videos. <laughs> There's your first lick. The next one is a really cool little scale deal. So, since rhythm guitar is hammering home that E, this whole solo sounds like it's in E something, mostly E minor. Um, but um, he's using kind of two synthetic modes and, and putting them together. You start out, the first part of that lick, That first lick you could call um, E Dorian sharp four. The second half of the lick, when he do, goes is playing in the lower octave, is more straight up E harmonic minor. Hits the low E, whammy bar dive and then he moves way up the fretboard. So that lick, whole step bend, don't bring it all the way down, just a half step, and then nice little pentatonic lick you can get, if you, if you can do the stretch, not so hard on that part of the fretboard. You get a nice little three notes of the minor pentatonic scale. A lot of uh, a lot of '80s metal shredders like to use this. Get some cool phrasing out of that, other than just the simple box pattern. All right. Now the next lick is where it gets a little hairy. Just a simple slide to E, like a little power chord, the perfect fifth. Probably doesn't mean to do this on purpose. He actually does. If you slow it down, you can hear him do a little slide backwards before he gets that flat fifth, the high B flat. All right, but this is the, the one you've all been waiting for, this diminished lick. So a diminished chord is a diminished seventh chord. All the notes are a minor third apart. On guitar, that means three frets. Um, Shredders like Ingve Momstein have been abusing all the cool patterns you could do forever, and uh, Frederick does no less on this cool lick here. So, three frets up, then he gets a six fret span here. Three frets down, three frets down. The cool thing about this is, when you skip a string, it's the same pattern a uh, string over on the E and the G string, first and third string. So and the way he slides and everything, you can just look at my transcription for that. I'm not gonna not gonna explain that. You can see it on the paper, but I'll do it slow for you again. I'll do it slow for you again a little better. Now, that stretch can be a little hairy. Most, well, I wouldn't say most, but maybe most, I don't know. A lot of guitar players would prefer to use their middle finger in the middle of that. I prefer to use my ring finger. Neither one is wrong. Frederick actually uses his middle finger. Neither one is wrong. A lot of it depends on how you hold your hand behind the guitar. If you're, if you're the kind of guitar player, well, your thumb needs to be in the back of the neck. There's no playing this lick with your thumb way up here, unless you got some kind of freakishly huge hand. But when your thumb's behind the neck, if you have a very vertical look 
like that. Or I'll show you like your thumbs very vertical behind the neck like that. Your fingers will probably line up a little better with ring finger in the middle. If you like to do a little bit of a thumbs up behind the neck, your hand will slant. Nothing wrong with that if it's not too much to, to a too great degree. And your middle finger will line up better on that. So after that, just a couple of little straightforward E minor licks in there. Um, all right, clean guitar. So put down your pick for this guy. Um, coming right out of the solo, a little hard to hear on the record, but. Little lick based on little E power chord, E and B, plus the open B and E strings. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, Opeth loves to do a lot of stuff with uh, playing the same notes on different strings. You get that nice B and B effect like earlier in the song. Now, how are you going to play it with your right hand? It's a couple different ways. This is a little oversimplification, but generally I break down right hand finger picking into classical picking, no pinky, and folk picking, no ring finger or pinky. So, and it kind of depends on how much work you want your thumb to do. A lot of times the folk picking, again, this is totally an oversimplification, don't beat me up for it. A lot of times the folk picking is a little better because you get that, you, your thumb is going to end up doing more work. You get that nice thumpy little bass line on the bottom. But using three fingers sometimes makes life easier because your fingers don't have to move around as much. I've kind of been doing it both ways. I'm not even settled on which way I like to do it yet, but um, I probably would choose the classical way. Classical way is nice and easy because on that riff, each finger is assigned to a string. When you do finger picking with your right hand, this is really important, should have a really lazy thumbs up look to it. If your fingers are too much like this, the problem is these fingers are not the same length. When you change your hand to that nice lazy thumbs up look, these three fingers will pretty much line up in the right place. Um, a lot of times really good finger style players, you can't see what their hand is doing just because of the nature of the way your hand falls over the strings. In the second half of the riff, of course, he has that little pull-off in there. Cool. Next, no, the next clean part. This one isn't obvious at all, but you're playing a minor third here, and you have the open G string, moving it up three frets, there's that diminished seventh arpeggio again. try to slow it down for you, although it's a little tricky to play slow when you've been playing it too fast for too long. So the right hand, first part's very simple, thumb assigned to A string, fifth string, Index finger assigned to G string, third string, and middle finger assigned to B string, second string. And ring finger assigned to first string. This is totally doable without ring finger, but it requires your middle finger to kind of hop back and forth, which makes it a little awkward for these two fingers and the strings they have to hit. So I prefer the classical style for this. especially at the end of that high triplet, where you have to go first string, third string, fifth string. Again, if you have really good technique, if your hand is in that nice relaxed thumbs up position, these fingers will line up to their proper strings and you barely have to think about it. Little funny time signature in there, you'll notice in the transcription there's an 18-8 measure. Um, 
I could have written that a couple different ways. A better way would probably be to write the first half of that as a 6-8 measure and then followed by a 12-8 measure, but I just wanted to do as few uh, time signature changes as possible. It's sort of like triple it, triple it, one, two, three, four. Triple it, triple it, one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Again, I have a tendency to screw it up if I play it too slow. But um, again, you don't have to worry so much about the time signature there. Just keep your triplets nice and even. Uh, all right, next part. Next part. Very, very cool. Again, only using three fingers here because you're only playing three strings. Thumb assigned to A string, index assigned to D string, middle, th middle finger assigned to G string. Um, you have a little grace note hammer on in the beginning. Then this hammer on is very cool. Remember in 12-8, everything's triplet, 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 but Opeth has a tendency to do this, uh, especially Michael and his leads will do this a lot. Even though you have the triplet feel, he'll squeeze in four and a beat. What would normally be written as 16th notes here, you could write as four eighth notes with the denominator underneath uh, uh, four notes, colon three, meaning four notes in the time of three notes. Taka taka, one yenda, or however you would count 16th. Cool. After that, it gets nice and quick and heavy, and you have those, um, how did I write them, 16th notes in 12-8. So it's important when you play this riff that, again, like before, you're not spazzing out to get the speed. You want to feel them. There's a couple different ways you can do this. The way I like to do it, since we still overall have a triplet feel, triplet, 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 you can, instead of trying to count every single note, you end up getting tongue-tied, you can count all your downstrokes. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you count all your downstrokes, and of course, if you're picking in both directions, you have the note in between. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. For this riff to sound good, it's important that you're on time. Too fast is just as bad as too slow. Then you got some just simple three note power chords up here. F to E. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of thrash players would play that over here. Kind of a brighter sound, but Opeth I think likes that dark sound. And also this is cool for this riff because you're gonna be sliding back and forth. Quick open E or an X on the record. It's not quite clear. He doesn't do it quite the same way every time. F power chord. Slide it right back on up. After doing that riff twice, you get to the next clean part, based on a little E minor chord. Not finger style here. Picking through all six strings. Now when you're picking like this, um, really kind of depends on picking something nice and ringy like this. Technically, sometimes you should be alternate picking everything. But that's a pain doing all six strings at this speed, so you can just do all downstrokes. Depending on how fast you're going when it comes to sweep picking, you know, if you're doing one of these guys, your hand can go nice and smooth through, and you should be used to doing that. In order to keep your timing honest, you can put a little bounce in there, but be careful. If you start picking too bouncy, it's going to create a lot of tension in your hand, and you're not going to be able to do it very fast. 
next riff is really hard to hear on the record. So if you listen live, you can hear because the uh, the keyboard's doing something kind of weird with hitting E over and over again and some weird little E minor or, or E diminished arpeggio. But all the guitar is doing it after the E minor chord is this. All the guitar is doing is this. Pretty simple. Cool. And then, next part, got this little flat five octave. And he's moving three frets at a time until he changes strings, but they're all minor thirds. Um, and you guessed it, again, we have our diminished, arpe the diminished seventh arpeggio. Whole riff is. There's the slide solo in there, which if I get a lot of requests, I'll figure that out too, but I don't have that right now. Um, the very last time. Up and back down. Then we're back to that previous riff we spoke about. But if you're playing this live or planning on playing through the song through beginning to end, which you probably would, this part you can use with a pick because otherwise you're going to be putting down the pick, picking it back up, unless you want to throw it at the crowd, take the one out of your mouth, who knows. But the same riff can easily be played with a pick too. And then we are back to our 16th note triplets. Same exact riff as before, and that leads us to one of my favorite riffs in the song. This one I find really satisfying. So you start off with octaves way up here on G sharp, and on the A string, and you're hitting the E string with it. Really, really cool sound of distortion. What you're doing is actually playing two out of three chords of an E major, two out of three notes of an E major chord, and pretty much sounds good enough to spell it out. Um, Smashing Pumpkins, I know, popularized that kind of sound with the low open string and the octaves on top. By no means probably the first band to do it, but I know they had hit with that. So, um, but what makes this riff so satisfying, remember that note in the middle of octaves that were squishing? We can finally slam down on that note and hit it. And I, again, I just find that so satisfying. One more time that riff. So we're starting on G sharp for the music theory people out there. When we add the flat five of the G sharp, we're actually completing an E7 chord. No fifth, but the fifth is optional anyway. Move it up to B on the 14th fret. Then we add that F in there. That's the flat nine of the low E, giving us a nice tension on that. And then we're moving around more octaves. Keep in mind that octave shape is pinky has to go, you have to go one fret higher on the higher note once you move over to the fourth and third strings because of the stupid way the guitar is tuned. And you're just moving octaves around there. Important thing here when you're, when you're learning it, practice it nice and slow. Make sure your right hand keeps moving nice and even. In order to do that, get a nice strummy motion. You want to get good at killing a lot of strings while you do it. In fact, I'll hit four or five strings on a lot of these. You notice my left hand 
I'm killing all those other notes. It's important to get that nice strummy free sound, open sound when you do the octaves. <laughs> Keep in nice triplets. It is a little awkward where he decides to move beat wise. With a little practice, keeping that right hand nice and even. It'll help. Also, changing strings when you're doing octaves is a little bit of a pain. Getting it to sound clean. Getting it to sound clean is really a, a function of how well you're muting the other strings while you move. Very last time, your last ending. Just a little three note power chord on D. Um, very often with Opeth songs, using so much distortion, it's kind of hard to hear on the record how much they're strumming it. When in doubt with Opeth, actually strum through. It's no pattern like, uh, it's not the pattern I just played like. Just hit it straight through. There's that one long note at the end of the, at the end of that, after the slide. Also, I'm gonna take this opportunity to mention two or three note power chords. What's the difference? When should you use them? How do you even know? So two note power chord is just root and fifth. Three note power chord is when you do root, fifth, octave. Depending on the recording, it's very hard to hear sometimes whether it's a two note or a three note. My own personal rule when I'm writing stuff and if I'm playing a song for fun, if the chords aren't moving very quickly, I'll do a three note one. If they're moving pretty fast, or even a little fast, I'll play the two note ones just because moving the three note ones is a little more sticky on the guitar. You got an extra finger down and you don't get much difference out of it. Um, sometimes in Opeth songs, because uh, just the, the sound of the guitar they'll use, you can usually make it out a little better whether they're hitting that top one. Uh, I, as I'm recording this, I don't even know if you'll be able to hear the difference. I don't know if I'll be able to hear the difference. But since he stays on that first power chord for a little bit, I'll do the three note power chord there. And definitely the two notes at the end of them. All right, next riff. So you start off, nice little E7. This little lick, these six notes, it's all about where you move your hand. So I'm gonna call it Greg's rule. You can get away with one hand movement at a time of doing just about anything, whether it's trying to use the same finger in two different places. You can move your hand once without having really much of an interruption in sound. Um, so if you figure out where the ideal place for that is, you can very often pl play a riff that might be otherwise a little awkward and make it a lot easier. So one thing about Michael in riffs, he doesn't like using his pinky. He does use his pinky, but a lot of times if you can do it without pinky, there's a good chance that's how he's doing it. So after the E7 arpeggio, arpeggio, of course, we're playing the chord one string at a time. Have an open E and then... Now, if you didn't want to move your hand for that, another great exercise, you could do it like that. But I can play it just as smooth without using pinky. And you don't really hear a difference. The key is splitting up into two groups of three. The first group is in sixth position, meaning index finger assigned to, I'm sorry, in fourth position, meaning index finger assigned to fourth fret. The next group is in third position, move your hand down, although ring finger has your first note on fifth fret. 
and then move. So you get three, uh, you get two really easy uh, licks consisting of three notes each. And you can look at the transcription for uh, which notes are picked. A hammer on top. And then a pull off at the end. Real slow, one at a time. Connect them. And put all the first half of the riff together. All right, then you are back to your, um, you are back to your E7 chord. I'm sorry, no, you're not back to the E7 chord. What am I talking about? Oh yeah, you are back to your E7 chord. So, it's funny, playing the riff slowly, it's easy to get lost. Back to E7. Then here are our octaves again. This part's pretty ringy. You can let the open E ring while you do this. Then the higher guitar part here is a really cool little lick. So um, the way I work this timing out is that you have five notes in the space of three. Now as he's sitting there with pen and paper and calculator and going, I have to fit these five notes into space of three. I'm sure he's not. It's just kind of hand friendly. And since we're still in the key of E, um, this would be kind of a hard thing to give a name to. Uh, you, could, you could say that this is from the Lydian scale, sharp two. So Lydian, sharp two, which is a synthetic mode. But don't, don't discount the fact that Michael and a lot of other excellent metal composers figure out something and say, hey, that sounds cool. Who cares what it is? And you're going to finish out the riff with a couple more octaves. Really based on the Lydian mode, if you're curious. You got your major third, sharp four, perfect five, or augmented four. So put that whole riff together. Kind of a shame, it only happens twice in the song. It's one of the really cool riffs. Okay, now we are getting to the end. Next riff is just all octaves. Pretty simple. Be careful about what's, what's a legato slide. and what notes are just picked. Next, you're gonna be hitting those E flat fives from the beginning of the song. But make sure to give them a nice, uh, they're all staccato, which means they're not going to ring their full value. There's going to be a little space between the notes. In order to do that really clean when you're using a ton of distortion, make sure you use both hands to stop the strings. Right palm, like palm mute, but a little further up. And these two fingers aren't doing anything. So together you get really nice, quiet space between the, between the notes. The next lick in my transcription does not show you at all what's really happening. Um, the best I can tell is that he's doing tremolo picking, which here you can spaz out. You can pick your right hand as fast as possible. That's kind of what tremolo picking means. And my transcription says he's going from one, a slow slide all the way up to 12. But what he's really doing is just some nonsense with the rest of his fingers on the string. Since the guitar is doubled, it doesn't sound nearly as much like a mess as just impossible to hear what's really going on. I guess you'd say that's a mess. And then finally, when you get to the 12th fret, you let it ring for a while. 
And then you have the outro. Outro, lead part, played live by Michael, is um, all in the third, so almost all in the third string. And again, my transcription doesn't quite uh, reflect this. You're gonna use pretty much two fingers on this. Now, um, poor guitar players only get good at using a couple fingers, unless of course you're Django and you can't help it. But um, there is sometimes legitimate reason to only use one or two fingers. You wanna hear the sliding all around. It really adds character to the melody. And until the last note, that's all happening on third string. Whenever I have a real slidey single note thing like that, I like to use middle finger. It's the closest to the center of your hand, tends to be the strongest, you have the most control over it. And that just happens six times to the outro. The rhythm guitar there, very cool part. So if, if your friend is still with you at this point, starting on a nice beefy, there's your wimpy, regular old fashioned B power chord. But by adding the fifth in the lower octave, you get this nice beefier sound. And as I mentioned before, we can start with a three note power chord put the octave on top because this, this power chord isn't going anywhere. You're holding it for almost an entire measure. So you get this four note beast. And again, you have your B power chord, adding the octave of the root on top, adding the octave of the fifth on the bottom. Nice beefy chord. Got your two single notes, E, F sharp. Then this, I nicknamed this the ACDC G power chord. Power chord is just root and fifth. But the G power chord can be played root, X, open, open. And there's your fifth again up there on, on D. Make sure you kill the A string. ACDC uses this all the time. Play the G5 like that and the D5 like that and you've got a lot of ACDC songs under your belt. Add a C sus too and you got it all. So anyway, um, playing a G major chord here, by the way, to contrast, with that level of distortion, just a little too staticky. So, got our G5. So we start off with our nice beefy B power chord. G5, open E, then root five, or what I call A shape from the cage system, minor chord. It's a bar chord. Make sure you get index finger on five strings. You actually want the low E still ringing. And then the next chord, you're gonna drop everything except for ring finger and the bar. And in this context, I would call this um, an E7 sus2. Then uh, you're back to your B power chord. AC, DC, G. Back to B power chord. AC, DC, style G. And then this last lick is a little awkward until you get used to it. It's not hard, but it kind of spans a lot of frets. So you're gonna slide up here. I like sliding with pinky because it makes the next two notes you have right, right here you don't have to change your hand position. Open A. F sharp B, F sharp. So, and you can also break it down by what's happening on each string. So on your A string you're on seven, five, four, oh. On the E string, two, oh, two. It's a good way to practice something like that if you're having trouble with it. Go one string at a time. Don't worry too much about the timing at first. And then the last part. Oh, I almost forgot the open A. Last part. Oh, five, seven, nine. 
and you actually hear that it's a legato slide, meaning you, you don't pick the resulting pitch, seven to nine. So if we break down that little last lick by string, seven, five, four, oh, then on the E string, two, oh, two, three, back on the A string, A, five, seven, nine, four, put it all together, and that outro riff rhythm guitar. That brings you to the end of the song. Thank you very much. Please check out my band, Terriginous, and uh, feel free to drop a comment. And stay tuned for the playthrough.